to Heart Snuggles. I hope everyone is having a great day today. And we have a super fun guest and I'm so excited. So if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hey, uh, my name's Freya, Freya Graf. I'm a yoni mapping therapist from Australia and, and I'm also a holistic sex coach and educator. Incredible. And how did you get started in this field? Um, I suppose it was a bit of a long meandering journey. I mean, I didn't, I didn't kind of sit in class when I was a kid and go, I want to be a sex coach one day. Um, but I, I sort of had a, had a crack at a few different uh, career paths and dabbled in a few different areas. I did, you know, I was a cook for a few years and I worked in childcare as well at a kindergarten um, and just sort of slowly but surely started doing a little bit of, I guess, personal development work and going to workshops and trainings and retreats and things to kind of work on myself and my you know, my conditioning and my patterns that I was kind of carrying and allowing to dictate my life. Um, and once I started getting a taste for that kind of self-development um, tip, I realized that the final frontier, you know, this one area that I still hadn't looked at was sex and sexuality. And I just... I wanted to curl up in a ball and just rock myself backwards and forwards because it terrified me so much. And it was an area of, um, oh, it was just so fraught with all sorts of, you know, shame and guilt and trauma and crappy sexual history from my teenage years and early 20s. You know, I mean, I think most women can relate to that. Um, but I think I had a, I was particularly, um, challenged and, and quite crippled in that area and so when I became a bit of a self-development junkie for a hot minute there I was like all right let's fucking do this like I need to just tackle this head on and throw myself in the deep end and deal with it once and for all because it's really affecting my my life my relationships my self-confidence everything um, and then I started dabbling in the Tantra scene and going to a few sacred sexuality workshops and retreats and yeah, slowly but surely chipping away at all of my shit around sex and, and body image um, and intimacy. And then, yeah, eventually I just realized how powerful it was for me to be overcoming these massive, massive barriers and all of these, you know, fears and deep seated beliefs that I had been holding my whole life and I was like damn oh my god this is changing the game and I just started becoming really passionate about it and thinking fuck if I can do this then I can definitely help other people do this um and I just I felt like it was really important started kind of thinking maybe maybe I could you know facilitate workshops or you know whatever um and kind of then trained in massage and um, tantric massage and eventually, yeah, found found the Yoni Mapping Therapy training and applied for that. And yeah, I mean, ever since I've just been throwing myself into that whole world deeper and deeper and realizing that, yeah, it's just something I'm so passionate about when it comes to women's, um, I guess, empowerment and holistic sexuality and their, you know, self-confidence and self-esteem and how they move in the world and how they relate and yeah it's all just um juicy stuff so that was a long-winded explanation but yeah I kind of just I just fell into it through my own um self-exploration basically that's so beautiful. There's so much fucking shame around sex. It makes me so upset. And just like thinking about my little girl, like I was so fearful and so in the unknown. My parents never talked to me about it. Like it is such a, I don't understand why that topic is, has so much shame and so untalked about. It's like, we all do it and we all need to experience it. And it's one of the most important parts of life. And yet it's like, don't talk about that. Don't learn about that. So like, I feel you and I'm so happy you're sharing it because yeah, I love seeing your stuff and your messages are so beautiful. And it like takes some balls to do that, even though it really shouldn't, because like I said, like we all do sex. So it's like, why is this a big thing? But yeah, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> And <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. And will you explain to us what Tantra means for people who don't know? 
Um, I suppose I'm probably not the authority on Tantra. That was kind of my gateway into sexuality work, but it's not my main focus anymore. I, I use it in what I do, but I'm definitely not an expert. And when it comes to trying to give a definition to Tantra, oh my God, I wouldn't even want to attempt it because there's so many different explanations and different um, branches and, and, you know, the kind of overall like realm of Tantra is actually not even originally about sex. So I think the way people see Tantra now in the West is it's actually more Neo Tantra, which is that sexuality piece. But I think originally like Tantra is a spiritual practice and it's, it's a yoga, you know? So I'm not even going to attempt to do that justice. Um, But my, my experience with Tantra was um, probably more that neo tantra stuff. So really about sacred, like coming at sexuality from a very reverent, honoring, respectful, sacred place. And there being a lot of kind of ritual and ceremony around that and really cultivating, uh, you know, awareness within your own body of, I mean, it's, it's, it's a more spiritual and um, very, intentional approach to sexuality and intimacy and relating um but yeah I'll I'll leave it there that's a huge (laughs) huge um topic (laughs) I don't know much I know like what you kind of just said like I just know a little bit about I've never actually studied it but yeah I didn't realize like how big it is but I did know that it is a origin of like yoga but thank you for being so honest and I know you know about yoni mapping so you tell us what that is yeah, I can totally talk on that that subject. Um, so yoni mapping therapy, there's there's a few different. Um, I mean, you're gonna hear yoni massage and yoni mapping. Actually, and, yeah. I was thinking we should probably first explain yoni because I realized recently a lot of people don't even know what yoni means. Oh yeah, totally good one. I'm so in the world that I just forget that that's not a super common term. Um, but that that sort of stems from a more tantric uh, background because yoni is a Sanskrit term for vagina, vulva, reproductive organs. You know that whole kind of uh, pelvic space for women, and it's kind of an all-encompassing term um, that I think it directly translates to something like a sacred space and. Um, birthplace of all life and you know there's also a few different um descriptions of of what it translates to but basically yoni equals vagina vulva um and so in the modality we've used that term because it is a really honoring and uh all encompassing term you know in in the western medical model it's like vagina which is only one part and vulva, which is just the external bit or uterus, like it's all, um, they've all got separate names, but nothing kind of, you know, encompasses all of that space. So Yoni was like, cool, that's, um, that's exactly what we're doing. We're working with all of that, that whole area. Um, but yeah, it is a little bit on the sort of woo-woo spiritual community side of things, which, you know, I do recognize might alienate or confuse some people. But, you know, we just don't have a better word for it at the moment. So, <laughs> um, so to answer your question about yoni mapping, um, there's, there's lots of different practitioners that might do things called yoni massage or yoni mapping or, you know, there's a lot of names for it now that it's becoming more popular and trendy. Um, but they are all kind of different, maybe similar, but different things. The thing that I practice is yoni mapping therapy and I'm just specifying that because it is a really unregulated um, industry and so you know someone could do like a a crash course online on how to massage a yoni and then be like I'm a yoni mapping practitioner like come and pay me money and I'm gonna get up in there Um, but what (laughs) what I did my training yoni mapping therapy is an accredited modality so it's you know, it's recognized by the IICT. It's, it's registered as a proper modality. We had to go through a proper training, just saying that because I'm trying to differentiate it from all of the other fluff out there. Um, And basically in a yoni mapping therapy session, it's usually about three hours long and we incorporate 
a, like a whole mixture of things. So there's talk therapy and coaching, sex education. So that kind of, you know, the talky part where I'm having a pot of tea with someone and we're getting an idea of where they're at and what they might need support with the most. I might be doing some sex education stuff and, and talking to them about some really practical um, info that will help them feel more knowledgeable about their bodies and empowered because they've got that, you know, proper education behind them. And then we move into some physical touch and body work. So I work with kahuna massage, which is a Hawaiian form of temple massage. Other yoni mapping therapists might do different kinds of massage. Um, but basically that, that is just to relax the entire body, honor the whole body, you know, help, help the woman feel really safe and respected and slowly drop into her parasympathetic nervous system so that we can, you know, move toward genital touch when she's feeling really relaxed and calm and safe and nurtured. And then I do some breast massage, abdominal massage, pelvic massage. I'll do external yoni massage, which is just the, the vulva. I'll be massaging the external parts of the vulva. And at that point, starting to kind of communicate about what I'm doing, what parts I'm touching, you know, giving her a little bit of uh, a guided tour of her anatomy just in case she doesn't know. Um, so helping her get familiar with, you know, each different part of her pleasure anatomy. And then if she's ready, we move towards internal vaginal massage and mapping. Um, and that involves like a full internal vaginal massage. So that's, I mean, there's so many reasons why that can be beneficial, like on a physical level, you know, we're releasing tension, we're working with scar tissue, we might be rehabilitating the pelvic floor after birth or preparing the pelvic floor muscles to, to give birth. Um, you know, there's, there's often tension and chronic pain or, you know, these sort of holding patterns within the pelvic floor and physical massage can be amazing for helping release that. And then we're also starting to create new neural pathways to that whole internal space because we often don't have a whole lot of sensitivity or awareness or articulation inside the vagina. And that's just because we don't, you know, we're not like, it's like a muscle that we're not using um, and a, a neural pathway that we're not treading often enough for it to become deeply furrowed and familiar to the brain. So all these places inside that internal landscape don't even know they exist like the brain doesn't even have a kind of pathway to that place so we're starting to create those and I'm talking to the client as I go and telling them where I am and what I'm doing and we're kind of you know piecing together a bit of a map of that internal space um, and then yeah you know there's like the energetic and emotional benefits we can be releasing trauma and shame and old memories and emotions that the body stores in the tissues we can be you know helping create a feeling of safety and respect like for that part of her body there's all sorts of things that come up and we can work within the session but I tend to ramble on because I'm so passionate about this so I'm gonna <laughs> cut myself off um, and wrap that question up. So after the internal work, I withdraw and we have a bit of a debrief and some integration time. And I send a follow-up email with a bunch of home play practices and some resources that we've you know, chatted about in the talk therapy section of the session. And then ideally they can kind of go on with the work themselves at home. Um, you know, sometimes it's just one session and that's all they need. And sometimes they come back and we work together for a few sessions. Um, but that's, that's the gist of it, basically. That's incredible. And it's just, uh, that just warms my heart because it's just like, it's funny to even think like you have to explain to a woman her own anatomy. Like we are so disconnected. Like I remember I did not go down there for the longest time. I didn't even want to look down there. I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> so yeah, like it's just so beautiful that you can guide women because that's such a sacred part of our body and to like actually connect people to that is so beautiful. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> And yeah, I actually went to a pelvic floor therapist, which sounds kind of similar, but yours sounds way more like beautiful and relaxing. And 
Um, I love that you like create the safety first and that you like, you really are so intentional, which I think is such a beautiful process to get there. Um, but what I found interesting was that um, I have a really tight pelvic floor and I think it's from yoga. Um, but you know, there's all these things that like do Kegels, do these pelvic floor exercises to tighten, tighten, tighten. And have you noticed that actually a lot of women do have tight pelvic floors? Oh my God, absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up because we have this whole like thing in our culture that like a tight pussy is a good one. And, you know, there's all these disgusting expressions like, oh, it's like throwing a hot dog down a hallway or whatever, which is just like, fuck off, dude. <laughs> Come on. It's not, it's not what we need to hear, you know? So I think so many women are really concerned that they're not going to be tight enough. And, you know, um, that's actually really unhealthy to have a tight pelvic floor. What we want is a strong pelvic floor and an articulate pelvic floor because there's all of these different muscles in there that can move independently of each other. But I mean, that's like super advanced shit. No one knows how to do that these days, except those um, <laughs> amazing women who can you know, shoot ping pong balls out of their yonis. That's because they've got really strong articulate vaginal muscles. Um, I digress. But yeah, basically like a tight pelvic floor, which often yogis can get, which seems really um, ironic and a bit counterintuitive because you'd think that, you know, yogis would have dope pelvic floors, um, but we can squeeze too much and we can hold too much. And often sitting down as much as we do nowadays creates chronic tension, you know, things like yoga and Kegels and like all of that squeezing and holding and like holding in our stomachs and things like that creates tension and weakens those muscles because those those muscles are holding on all the time like way more often than they should and for longer periods of time so they fatigue and they get tired and then when you actually do want to squeeze them they're already tight like they're already squeezed so there's like less of a um less of a contraction that they can do because they're already contracted so yeah the tight tight pelvic muscles are a bit of an issue because that that does create the weakness it creates numbness because they're contracted and constricted so the blood flow can't sort of happen in the way that it needs to to give all of the nerve endings like circulation which creates pleasure so tightness can often equal weakness and numbness um, and it is really common and that's something that I work with a lot of women in sessions with because um, we've just kind of we're just living in these really, really chronic patterns of holding and contracting and constricting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so fascinating. I went to a pelvic, oh man, I wish I could remember her name. She's like a pelvic floor therapist. She's a yogi and she does trainings everywhere. I'm sure you know her. I'll have to find her name later, but she's incredible. And I learned so much about that. And, um, yeah, that's when I discovered I should go to a public floor therapist. And I was like, oh shit, I got a tight pussy and it's not good. <laughs> and I like was having pain. I had, like, <laughs> I had a lot of, I had like chronic pain down there. And I later found out it was because I w didn't feel safe in the relationship and like everything I tried wasn't working. But anyway, so, um, so if someone's looking to like find a practitioner where they live, how do you suggest that they find someone that's like safe and like really knowledgeable and good place to go? Um, yeah, that's the trick one because like I said earlier it is quite unregulated and there's there's a lot of gray areas in this industry so um it's often tricky to tell how much training or experience someone's had I usually go off you know kind of like common sense so things like you know do you know someone that's been to them have you got a personal recommendation from them I, I wouldn't go to someone unless I had a recommendation from them uh, from someone about them or if I I mean I think nowadays it's really cool with I mean much as much as I kind of resent social media it is great because you can follow someone for a, a long time and you can get a feel for the way they work you can read um, testimonials from clients you know go to their website see if it's see if it looks legit see if they've got testimonials see if they've written where they've trained what modalities they've trained in, what their background and their history is and how many years of experience they've had and things like that. Um, just the more of those things that, you know, you can tick off the list, 
the more likely it is that they're trustworthy and reliable and credible and they've got some experience behind them. Um, and yeah, I, I'd say just like really do your research and before you book in, follow them for a while, see what they're doing, see if they're writing blog posts, see if they're, they've got a social media presence. And um, maybe also like I offer for people to book in just to call me and have a 15 minute chat to speak about, you know, what they're hoping to work on in the session. And that gives them an opportunity to, you know, just hear my voice and what I sound like and how I receive them and their issues. And we can see if there's a bit of a rapport there and just feel into whether you trust the person. Um, yeah. So I guess it's just, you know, common sense, things like that. And yeah, I mean, there's, it's tricky. Yoni mapping therapy, the modality I do, there's only 25 of us in the entire world that are qualified to do this modality so you know if you're not in an area where there is one of us then tough luck so maybe yeah looking looking online for other things that seem other modalities that are similar and seem seem legit basically yeah yeah thank you for that because it's such a like I can't imagine like going finally like getting the courage to do that and then being brought with someone that like is ruining the experience so yeah, yeah. thank you for sharing that because it's so important yeah no worries that is it is devastating when I get clients who have gone to another practitioner first and then they've had a really traumatic experience and you know it's it kind of breaks my heart every time I hear about that um so yeah I mean also people can get in touch with me and see if I know of anyone in the area or like send me the person that they're thinking about going to send me their profile or their website and I can have a little do a bit of detective work um <laughs> I may or may not be able to help but you know you never know <laughs> so good and I want to talk a little bit about shame like the shame we carry as women about our breasts and about our um our vaginas and um and I saw a post once you put about like porn kind of plays a part in that and so how do you help women like just accept exactly how their body is like I mean it's it's different for everyone it depends where the shame's coming from like some clients come with shame from a religious upbringing or you know some trauma from when they were younger which can be as seemingly minor as you know a kid in school saying something offhand about their bodies or making a comment and then that poor young girl just like internalizes that and carries it for her whole fucking life. You know, it doesn't take a lot. And unfortunately, you know, we usually don't get through our childhood and our teenage years unscathed. We, we generally tend to come up against a shitload of negative messaging and you know, conditioning from our family and ancestral shit that we've taken on from, you know, it's, it's, yeah, poor womankind really, really does it rough in that department. So generally like no one gets away scot-free and moves into adulthood without some degree of shame or body image stuff or guilt around their own pleasure. Um, so I kind of, I'll often work on that as like a foundational first step, you know, even if someone's coming to me and they're saying, oh, I can't have an orgasm with my partner. Like what, yeah, help me with that. Um, like I always go back to their relationship with themselves and their own bodies and their own sexual identity. And we start there because that's like ground zero. Um, and, you know, it could be some regular self-love, self-care practices. Um, I tailor it to the, the woman depending on you know we've got a good hour in a session to chat about what um you know where she's at and so I kind of figure out what I think might be the most useful to her um you know and similarly with coaching clients like I, I work I love that because I work with them over like you know a few months so we can try some stuff to begin with and see how they go with that and then I might give them some other little things to do and I think like a big thing as well that I talk about with clients is you know, I can say so much and they can do so much, but then it's also stuff that you wouldn't expect that can be affecting it. So pretty much um, if you think of like everything external that you're allowing into your field or your brain, this external input and the stuff that we consume in terms of media 
um, and conversations and the people we surround ourselves with. So I kind of think of it as like, what is your brain consuming? What beliefs and what information is it consuming? And is that actually making you feel more like shit? And usually it is, you know, like mainstream media and um, it depends. Like I try to encourage people to surround themselves with other people that are kind of at least a bit sex positive or body positive and have conversations with people more and more about this stuff to normalize it and take away that element of like, oh, it's so shameful and stigmatized and it's too taboo to talk about you know the more conversations you have about sex the better because then you're going to realize it's not this big scary thing that you know has to be behind closed doors it's it's fucking normal and everyone loves talking about sex and the more you talk about it with people the more you realize that you know your experience isn't isolated you're not alone like you're super normal and you can kind of get that you know dialogue happening with various people to really you know really I guess well it starts healing it starts healing the shame because if something is you know shameful and you're too afraid or feel too much too embarrassed to talk about it it kind of gains power by being under the covers or in the shadows but if you're shining light on it and you're having you know regular conversations even that in itself just slowly starts to dismantle the shame and heal that relationship. Um, So yeah, stuff like the books that you're reading, podcasts that you listen to, accounts that you follow on social media, all of that is input that you're consuming. And all of that is contributing to the overall like message that your brain gets. And then that message contributes to how you feel about your body and sexuality. So you know, you can, you can do a bunch of self-love, self-care, self-work, which is awesome. That's like one really important thing. But then the other thing is like, yeah, what are you allowing into your brain? And that's way more insidious because we often don't think about that, but it's contributing all the time, you know? That's yeah. Important. It's such a good point because our body is no matter if we're conscious or not, like it's consuming whatever is around us. So it's so important to be intentional yeah. about what is, what is it consuming? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. And um, why do you think that women compromise their own needs for men? (laughs) Oh, it's a big one. It goes so deep, doesn't it? You know, the whole, the whole people pleasing, self sacrificing um, trope. So I, I, I think it's something that goes back generations and unfortunately that means it's like this really really deep-seated um pattern that we see just through like families and upbringings but also just like our entire culture so our whole culture basically like glorifies and expects these really like overly empathetic people-pleasing self-sacrificing like it turns women into like martyrs basically and it expects that kind of behavior from women and it, it pedestalizes it. So, you know, to be like a good, and it's super, it sounds so old fashioned, totally. It's really outdated, but like, even though we've come really far, it's still, and it's not as explicit and in your face, this like, Oh, you've got to be a good wife and a good mother. And like women, you know, should be seen and not heard and like, blah, blah, blah. It's not as obvious as that anymore, but it's still really, really, like it's it's everywhere and it does kind of underlie so much still you know it's it's just the culture that we live in so we're you know we're brought up in this way where we believe that we need to put others needs before ours um you know we've got that really maternal instinct as well usually like women we we want to nurture and look after other people and we're especially once you have kids, like you're putting everyone else's needs before yours. And that's, that's kind of, um, you know, then that influences the way that we are in the bedroom as well. So the way we are in our life, in our day-to-day life is usually reflected in the bedroom and the way we do life where we're kind of pleasing everyone else and trying to, you know, we want people to like us and we want to help other people, which is because we're empathetic, lovely fucking people um, that then actually turns on us and is not, you know, doesn't 
sort of work in our favor in the bedroom because then we sort of again think like that the other person's pleasure is more important than ours and you know our pleasure can kind of wait it's not priority um there's also this whole thing around women not feeling like they deserve pleasure um or that we're worthy of it so that goes really deep as well you know that's a self-worth self-esteem thing and that kind of that could be you know stem from like gender inequality and I mean all of these things run so fucking deep but basically like the way it plays out nowadays is we have this deep-seated belief that we're not worthy and we don't deserve pleasure and that sex is actually about you know your partner's pleasure or the man's pleasure in like hetero terms um and you know that's also really outdated but I still get so many clients who have always seen sex as something that they you know are kind of obliged to do it's like their duty and it's it's all about the guy it's all about their pleasure and it's performative so you know they're not actually doing it for their own benefit or pleasure they're doing it because they want the guy to be happy and they think that to be a good girlfriend or wife that's part of what they need to do um yeah so it's a really tough one to to tackle because it's so insidious like that belief yeah it's pretty it's pretty widespread even if it is on a subconscious level um because more and more people are just like hang on (laughs) no that's bullshit you know like we've come really far again we've we totally we're in a better position than we have been for a long time when it comes to these things but yeah it's still it still plays out um and just because we are naturally more empathetic um and more willing to sacrifice our own needs for others than men like than our male counterparts like that just automatically means that often we yeah we come last um and the fact that women like female bodies do actually take longer and require a different approach like a slower approach to male bodies you know that furthers that that makes it even more difficult because male bodies like they can become turned on and aroused in like two seconds flat they can feel pleasure really easily it's super accessible to them it's always been a lot more um i guess accepted for men to masturbate like that's expected and it's really accepted it's really you know like normal um but for women like masturbation is so much more shameful and it's not as expected and it's you know so there's that that difference or that inequality there that means like women already feel shame around their own pleasure and they also are usually less in touch with how to how to allow pleasure like men know how to fucking feel pleasure. It's really easy. It's really accessible for them. But so many women, like it's actually more difficult and it's less accessible for them. And so then when it comes to like being in the bedroom, they, you know, they are going to be taking a bit longer than the man to actually be ready to actually feel pleasure. Their, their, you know, their orgasm is probably less accessible than the man's is. And then it just is way easier for them to be like, oh, okay, well, like I'm taking too long or I can't take up this much time or space or it's too much effort for him. I feel bad about it. Like I feel guilty. What a burden. Oh my God. I'll just please him. It's easy. Boom. You know? So like, Oh fuck. I could talk about it forever. There's like so many angles and so many ways that we get the raw end of the deal. Um, But you know, there's, there's hope and it's changing and I'm chatting to more and more people about it and people are waking the fuck up up and they're claiming their pleasure and they're standing in their power and they're taking up more space and time you know like but it's just it's just education you know we all just need to know like we need to change the script yeah that's so powerful and it's yeah it's so deep like oh there's so many different ties and so many like you just said you just tackled a lot of them but there's still more and um and all those things you tackled really hard to move through and to work through especially if you've or imagine if this is the first time you've heard any of this like that's all you're just like holy shit <laughs> so yeah that's like a lot a lot um so if, how do you help or what do you suggest for women that are um in a relationship or having sex with a man like how can they ask for their pleasure to be experienced or like you know like how can they 
I don't know, you know, like use their voice to, um, to their person that they're with. Oh, that's such a tough one because it really depends on every like individual relationship dynamic. Like I, I wouldn't want to be like, oh, you should just, um, just be more assertive and, and just go, Hey dude, what the fuck? Can you just go down on me for like 20 minutes? And then, you know, like, I don't know, it's, it's really hard to just prescribe a way forward as a, as a general recommendation, because some partners of women would be really open to it and receive receive feedback and guidance and direction really well they would be open-minded about you know hearing these sort of new concepts if they were new to them but some wouldn't be you know and then that poor woman might have gotten up the courage to like talk about her needs and try to assert you know her needs and and it wouldn't be received well or ugh, fuck it's really really tough and that's this is like what I'm tackling all the time and it's why I like working with women one-on-one so that I can like kind of assess their exact situation and like gauge from them you know what their partner's like how he does receive it when she brings up her desires or if she sort of tries to guide him and and you know like the really sad thing is that I do hear a lot that um you know, men or partners of these women get kind of um, like crestfallen or um, quite confronted or challenged if the woman is trying to ask for something or give him feedback or guidance. Like say, you know, a woman's like, oh, that's great. I Like, I love what you're doing, but would you be able to please, um, you know, like suck on my nipple while you're stimulating my g-spot or like if could you go down on me and just like reach up and like fondle my nipple or like put your finger in my ear whatever like I'm just trying to pull examples out of the air but you know even it sounds really simple and like what guy wouldn't love a bit of direction like they want to please us they want us to feel good so like you know that's an opportunity to learn what she likes and to to please her but so many men and like this happens with everyone you know it's not just men um yeah they get emasculated or they feel um they feel like a failure they feel like they can't please their woman um they feel like they it it just dents their ego basically and so instead of that being well received and just an opportunity for them to like fine tune how they go about loving this person and making love to them they actually like they take it pretty hard and then they suck about it and they're just giant babies about it and um and don't take it as an opportunity to learn and improve they actually like get offended and it allows them uh, they they allow it to you know it, it they they get in their heads you know they start feeling insecure about their sexual prowess and so there's this really it's such a bummer that like sex is so taboo and so stigmatized and we don't talk about it and we don't get educated about it properly because then it leaves people vulnerable to being in these positions where like it should be really normal to just like give each other feedback and ask for what we want and say what we don't like but actually it's just another way that that person can feel insecure and like oh my god no fuck like because no one wants to think that like feel like they don't know what they're doing and they're not able to please the person that they love but like realistically how are you meant to know if you if you don't like practice and give and receive feedback and you haven't had an education around it so it's like it's a bit of a catch-22 because then when these partners respond badly to like guidance and feedback and then they get all sooky about it and they're like oh you know their egos are bruised then that woman doesn't feel safe to bring it up again and doesn't feel safe to give direction and guidance and then there's like not this beautiful safe container where they can learn about each other and calibrate to each other's bodies it becomes this like thing where she's just like oh that didn't go down well it made him feel shit now he's in his head and his bone is gone and like I'm not fucking doing that again like I'll just go along with it next time it's easier and so there again, she's sacrificing her needs to, you know, to sort of save him from having to be a little bit uncomfortable with the fact that maybe he's not a sex god <laughs> and there's room for improvement. I can't remember why I'm talking about this now. <laughs> oh, that was 
Yeah, you know, it's so true. Like, that's why I'm huge into holistic health. And it's like, everyone is their own individual. And there's so many layers to every single person. So there isn't just one way to do it. Um, but yeah, that must be so hard when you're guiding people, because there, it is such a touchy subject. And oh, it just yeah. makes me so sad that like in it, in it, I was even thinking too, when you're saying that, like, that just reminds me of when people set boundaries, and people can't even hold space for boundaries. And so it's just like, or when you speak your own needs, just in a normal conversation, like that's hard for people to do or to receive. And so yeah, it's, it's not just in sex. It's like also so many areas. Yeah, totally. Communications are really, really tough one. That's another thing we're not really taught how to do in a mature, healthy way. And yeah, like I was saying, it's so different for every woman and every client. And I, I usually just try to figure out like, okay, what kind of partner is she with what are we dealing with here and sometimes like all I want to say is like get the fuck out of there like no he's not isn't your there's only so much like someone can do in terms of their own self-work and growth and getting really good at clear communication and really good at boundaries and assertiveness in a loving way you know if they've got a partner that's just like not working on themselves and not open to that it's they're, they're only going to get so far so I feel like sometimes it's more it's like you you just have to stop changing yourself to suit your partner and bringing yourself down to that level you know if you're not both rising each other up um, and supporting each other's growth and being open to that sort of communication then like yeah I wish I could just say I would never tell my clients to like leave their partner but I do try to open their eyes to the fact that maybe then you know they're not with a, the right person and that it would be a lot easier doing this work and, and practicing with communicating needs and desires if they were with someone who was open to that and helped create a safe space for that so yeah it's tricky it takes two but I figure if you do the work yourself and you're really like getting better at that communication and and you know looking out for your own needs and boundaries then usually the relationship either falls away because you're leveling up and you're kind of shedding the people that aren't meeting you on that level. Um, or I guess you stay in that same spot and just get more and more frustrated and you usually have a choice to make. It's like ditch them or I guess stop growing and keep sacrificing your own needs. And you know that sometimes that's an easy pattern to fall back into as well. So yeah, it's, it's, mm, it's a lot to navigate yeah and I, I witness it all the time in a lot of my friends relationships and it's so hard to hold space for them because you never want to tell anyone what to do but it's like oh you just see them in so much suffering and pain you're like it doesn't have to be like this like it really doesn't and then yeah. and then there's the shame of like just endings in general like and parents influence you like no you need to stay in this relationship and shame around divorce or like separation mm -hmm. and so it's so many layers everything has layers but yeah it's it's really sad so I hope that, <laughs> I hope that as a society we can also let go of the need to like stick with one person like if it's not working out you don't have to stick with them like you can't force anything like forcing anytime there's an energy of force you just know that it's not it <laughs> totally yeah a hundred percent yeah that's it is such a tricky thing when there is still this um negativity or shame around like endings and breakups and divorce and like sometimes it's just the best fucking thing and it's and we put ourselves through especially like once people have kids like I know my mom you know she stayed with my dad for years and years and years longer than she should have because she was like you know wanted to keep the family together and make sure us kids had a dad and I was just like bitch like come on it would have actually been so much better our childhoods would have been better if you guys had a split because you're fucking miserable and like you know it's just again she was sacrificing her own needs for what she thought was better for us so I think you've just got to really focus on yourself and it's not fucking selfish it's it's self-loving and it's loving to those around you because if you're looking out for yourself and you've got your own back and you're happy and juiced up it's going to affect everyone around you positively. Like that's just, it's black and white, you know? Mm -hmm. I agree. And I, yeah, it's so selfless. And I just, I think there's a big shift. Like people are starting to realize that, like, you know, the more that you take care of yourself, the more it just helps everyone out in your life. So I hope that, 
yeah, this helps people realize that. And uh, I just want to talk about one more thing, which you posted about recently too, was um, how we struggle to relax and how that also means you struggle mm -hmm. to orgasm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a really common one. That's, you know, usually when people come to me and they say they can't orgasm or they have trouble orgasming, um, you know, first of all, I'm like, so is it just when you're with a partner or is it all the time? Because that kind of tells me a lot, you know, like if, if they're able to like orgasm when they're solo, um, but not with a partner, usually it's like about being able to relax enough and surrender in somebody else's presence. Um, and also, you know, like when you're with yourself, you kind of know, you know what to do, you know what you like, you're in total control. So you can kind of just make that happen. Um, whereas with a partner, it's, you know, there's so many things at play and so many moving parts there. Um, but yeah, one of the most common reasons why people find it tricky to access orgasmic states, even with themselves, is like relaxing. It's, it's, we are constantly on, you know, the, the way that we live is so go, go, go. It's very yang. It's very masculine. Like the, the world that we live in, the culture, it's very like productivity and busyness and action. And, you know, it's like super fast paced and stressful. Like the average person has so many stress like externally from the outside world from their like job day-to-day -day life whatever that you know our nervous system like we don't know how to drop into our parasympathetic nervous systems on call you know we don't have that like usually you should be kind of pendulating between sympathetic and parasympathetic so like activation and like rest and restoration but we are in that activation stimulated space way more of the time than we are designed to be so then we get into this, this like cycle where it's really tricky to actually get out of that stressed activated um, state in our bodies and our nervous systems. Our minds are overactive. We're thinking so much. And then how that affects us in the bedroom is um, so basically like important to know, I should have mentioned this at the start for a woman's body or a female body. Sorry, I'm super binary, but it's just a habit. Um, it's, it's like necessary for us to orgasm, to be in the parasympathetic nervous system and be feeling really calm and relaxed and safe. Um, and that allows, you know, better blood flow, better circulation to the pelvic bowl, all of the nerve endings in our, um, you know, our erogenous zones are able to be filled with fresh blood and oxygen. And then that sort of becomes more sensitive because of that. Our erectile tissue needs to be able to become engorged. Um, so we have just as much erectile tissue inside our vaginas as a, a penis but ours is all internal and you can't see it as obviously. So we get hard ons too, but ours just take a bit longer to engorge and fill with blood. And if we're, if we're not relaxed and in, in that parasympathetic, then there's constriction of the blood vessels and there isn't great circulation around the body into the pelvic bowl, which means the erectile tissue can't fill up with blood and get all juicy and puffy and engorged and then that means the nerve endings aren't getting so you know there's just all this kind of cascade of um physiological things that happen in the body that then make up an aroused turned on state where pleasure is the most accessible to a woman and if we're not able to relax and we're not able to just surrender and feel really safe and calm then we're going to be in the parasympathetic uh, the sympathetic nervous system and those things won't be able to happen as they need to to feel the most amount of pleasure and so like that could even just be like we're overthinking we can't get out of our heads um you know female arousal is very context dependent which means like the context of our greater environment so like if you've had a stressful day at work that's kind of a stressful context which will mean that you're not able to relax could be the context as in your immediate environment so the room that you're in when you're trying to get jiggy you know the lights are too bright or there's noise right outside your window or you're worried that your child is going to walk in the door at any moment 
you know, so that's another negative context that'll impact your ability to relax and feel turned on. And then it could be like internal, like in your brain, that's, that's the context of your mind. And if you're like fretting about, um, you know, a fight that you've just had with your best friend or you're in your head thinking like, like, oh my God, he's going to notice that I've got that like big nipple hair that I forgot to pluck. And like, he, what, what, what do I smell like down there? My, you know, my tummy's like, uh, you know, there's just so fucking many ways that the context can be not ideal. And we mostly do it to ourselves as well. Like we're always thinking like negative shit about ourselves and worrying about what we look like and smell like and taste like and how we're doing and what we, you know, um, so we're kind of up against all of these like things that can prevent us from feeling relaxed because you're just distracted and overthinking and da, da, da. So the context is important. If you can kind of, um, you know, get, say like you're really good at meditating or you've just come out of a yoga class or you've just woken up from a nap and you're feeling really like dozy and calm and sleepy, you know, you could, you could have like a big dance or do some exercise beforehand, like anything that you know that helps you relax and calm your mind can be really helpful as a tool to like, you know, get you into the parasympathetic nervous system. And that will mean that any intimacy or pleasure after that will be enhanced and you'll have greater access. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's another topic I could talk about forever, but I'm, I'm conscious of our time coming to an end, but, um, yeah, basically relaxation equals more pleasure. And if you can't relax and you can't surrender and you don't feel safe in your body and in the context, ain't going to happen. It's going to be really tricky. Um, yeah. And, you know, again, the context could be the, the pressure that we put on ourselves to orgasm. Like if you're with a partner and you know that they're going to feel like a, like King Dick, if you know, they make you come, or if you have an orgasm, they're going to be really pleased. Then we're going to be wanting to have an orgasm even more for them. And we'll be putting this pressure on ourselves because we like feel, you know, we feel like what's wrong with us or am I broken? Why can't I have an orgasm? Oh my God, I really need to have an orgasm. Like I want, I want to have an orgasm and we try to get to it. And then of course that's not a relaxing, calm, safe environment. So that's another way that, you know, that can get in the way of our pleasure. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it's big. It's a big topic. There's a lot, there's a lot there. <laughs> so beautiful. And yeah, it's, yeah. Pleasure is, yeah. It's another thing we don't talk about even just, pleasure like from feeling the warm shower on your body how many times do I take a shower and I'm just like in and out and I'm like I didn't even experience the shower like there's so many moments of our day that we don't experience pleasure and so like bringing it into the bedroom is like it's so important and I'm so happy you talked about this this was so beautiful and we have to wrap it up sadly but I would love for you to share how people can find you and where your location is if people are in your area yeah, beautiful. Thank you. This has been so fun. Thank you for having me. Um, and in terms of, yeah, finding me, I've got a website. Um, I'm sure you'll chuck that in a link somewhere, but it's just www.freyagraph.com. I have an Instagram where I put like all the stuff that we've spoken about today, like I could talk about forever. And so I put a lot of content um, on my Instagram page. That's just Freya underscore graph underscore YMT um for yoni mapping therapy and yeah I mean I'm trying to get a bit of a newsletter happening I've got a mailing list I haven't given it much attention but I'm starting to realize like with all the censorship and the shadow banning on social media and things I need to like focus on you know mailing lists and and my website um so I put a blog post on the website I mail out you know info and blog posts to my mailing list so if you want to sign up for that that would be so dope I would really appreciate that because I want to build my list so that I can reach people with like really helpful content I'm it's not going to be spammy um that's not my jam and I'm based in uh western Australia around a place called Albany so if you're in this hood then we can have a one-on-one -on -one session we could do in person other otherwise I do online zoom coaching packages and things like that anywhere in the world so um we can do the talk talky part online um yeah that's 
that's basically it. Um, so I'd love, yeah, head over to the social media side of things or the mailing list or whatever. But I love chatting to people about this and I love hearing about people's experiences. So totally in touch. I'm really open to that. Um, yeah. And thank you, Lexi, for hosting this. This is really beautiful. I can't wait to listen to your other episodes. And yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is amazing. And I hope that we help heal more people through your beautiful, beautiful words. Thank you.